uh, um, the discussions around a sustained um, arrangement based on European rules have to have to start. And my third point goes zooms out again and taking the broader picture. Um, and there it's important that the Ukraine joined in 2011 the energy community. Ukraine is part of the Energy Charter Treaty and the procedure still. So in a sense, it's very important that Ukraine is part of the legal regulatory European space. And in a sense, the country is also a, a test case for the energy community and the functioning. In, 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 in respect to uh, yeah, the enlargement of EU rules and a key communautaire to the neighborhood, which is part of also yeah, the drive of, of the European Union. And in a more broader space, it is, as, as um, uh, Mr. Bild said, it's also a geopolitical issue and a key um, point whether Ukraine stays within the European um, sphere of influence and within and it sticks to Western values. And in that regard, of course, Ukraine transit is a key issue for Euro European energy security, as I mentioned before, with regard to swing supplies. Um, coming to the conclusions, um, there are a lot of known unknowns out there. And some much is, or not much, but some factors are outside the influence of Brussels, the Western influence, or at least the, the influence of Brussels. The first unknown unknown is the issue of US sanctions and the ongoing, let's say, geoeconomic conflict between US and, well, Germany and other countries plus the ongoing geoeconomic quarrels between US and China to a certain extent and how this will relate to LNG exports, for example. And then the other known unknown and a huge influential factor is Chinese demand for natural gas and Chinese um, Russian relations with regard to new pipelines, not only the power of Siberia, but also the Altai pipeline being in, in discussion. I'm mentioning that because this could really change the picture. My second point is on the conclusions. Of course, I think mentioning this necessity to um, keep Ukraine in the European space and also in the energy market does um, a demand the reforms of unbundling and an independent regulator as a prerequisite for any any deal and sustaining deal towards um, transit or, or, or transport to U Ukraine. And the third point um, is, of course, the worst situation we could think of for next winter is a situation with no deal and just modeling through, um, which is, uh, I, could, I could really imagine that we end up in a very tricky situation. I do see factors, and we can come back to that maybe in the discussion, that, of course, the negotiations with Russia will become much more difficult the longer we muddle through. And finally, and I'm linking that back to my beginning, I said security, energy security has changed in our understanding. And I would say there is another paradigm now in the room in Europe that looks to the end consumer, that looks to sustainable clean energy for all Europeans and the vision of, of, of a um, green planet for all. And this is where I think EU and Ukraine should also start to engage to have the kind of future idea for a Euro Ukrainian role within the Euro European energy market, which includes electricity as well, because we're talking about synchronization here, but also talks about um, possibilities of biomethane um, or bio, sorry, biogas and decarbonization of natural gas. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Uh, now the uh, last information for the panel is for, uh, uh, for Yuri Vitrenko, Executive Director for Naftogaz. Uh, I'd like to know more about his perspective regarding the future of the, of the transit and also especially if you could uh, perhaps also elaborate on what a no deal would mean for Ukraine and Europe. Thanks.
thank you first of all again uh, thank you the uh, to the organizers uh, epc uh, for such a wonderful event uh, thank you for everybody who came uh, it seems like it will be a very interesting discussion at least uh, from what i have heard uh, from the panelists um, um, and uh, there are some niceties about uh, nafta gas the way uh, we see our bright future in the nice brochures that you can find uh, on your seats uh, so I won't repeat it now, uh, and I would probably just uh, jump to, to conclusions, and there will be at least we'll try to be very straight to the point. So the um, topic of our today's event is the future of Ukraine gas uh, transit route and European energy security. So um, I will dare to say that uh, 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 in 2020 there will be no transit through Ukraine. Uh, meaning that uh, Ukraine, uh, I mean, not 30 BCM, 50 BCM or 60 BCM, just zero. Uh, when Nord Stream 2 is uh, finished this year, uh, there will be no need uh, for Russia uh, to use the Ukrainian gas transit uh, route. Um, and they would use any excuses or basically they won't even bother using any excuses. They won't just use the Ukrainian gas transit, transit system. Uh, it will mean that Ukraine uh, will lose uh, uh, approximately 4% of the GDP. And uh, now we have a moderate economic growth, so next year we will have an economic decline. Um, it will also mean that uh, the security of the European uh, energy uh, sector or European energy security will be undermined. Uh, because it will be a green light for Gazprom to continue its abuse of their dominant market position. So they will continue blocking uh, gas, for example, transit from Central Asia. They will continue blocking uh, exports of independent producers, even European companies producing gas in Russia. Uh, they would use these uh, predatory tactics uh, with uh, overinvestments in gas infrastructure to prevent new entry to the European market. So uh, European consumers will suffer. They will have to pay a much higher price because of these actions. Um, of course, it's a gloomy picture, um, uh, but as usually in life, uh, uh, again, until uh, it gets better, it gets worse. So it will get worse in 2020. But then I believe there will be a huge pressure on European politicians, first of all, German politicians, um, uh, to make them stick to Western values, um, uh, meaning that uh, they will have to uh, somehow explain uh, why projects like Nord Stream 2 that were positioned, as described, for example, by Kirsten, to uh, advance or enhance European energy security, would basically lead to such uh, dire consequences. Um, maybe, of course, again, there will be talented politicians in Europe uh, uh, finding excuses, blaming Ukraine for not doing something, basically, or whatever. Uh, but at the end of the day, again, in 2020, most probably, we will see, again, no transit and undermined uh, European energy security. Uh, why I'm so pessimistic about that, or realistic about that? Uh, and by the way, so, uh, again, it will get worse until it gets better, but when, uh, with growing pressure on uh, uh, the European politicians, they will get serious about the rule of law inside the European Union in respect of Gazprom, so they will start going after Gazprom in terms of the abuse of the uh, competition law, abuse of the energy law. They will start applying the European legislation on the ter territory of the EU in respect of uh, Gazprom without any exemptions. Uh, so why I'm again why I'm, I'm saying it uh, again I'm just basing my expectations on facts. So uh, I personally was a part of these trilateral consultations and negotiations, uh, kindly, again, facilitated by the European Commission. And here I can just say that we live in parallel worlds. So on one hand, uh, for example, as we heard from Kirsten, she's not representing the European Commission, I understand, but it's a very popular narrative uh, that we, by the way, fully support as Naftagas, as a company, that Ukraine should implement uh, all the European rules. Uh, as I mentioned before, this during this roundtable, we are, for example, supporting direct application of European rules so that there is no room for misinterpretation or whatever, uh, because the rule of law, or this principle of right versus might, is very important for foreign after gas. That's kind of the only protection that we have against a very mighty uh, enemy as uh, Gazprom. Um, 
But basically, again, on one hand, uh, the European Commission says you have to implement all the European rules, you have to follow all the European rules, again, uh, tariffs, unbundling, basically everything. We say, of course, yes, uh, there are certain problems, let's, let's just discuss it. But at the same time, uh, Gazprom says, look, we don't understand what you're talking about. Uh, a condition precedent for any negotiations, because what the European Commission calls negotiations, they call consultations. They don't even say that it's, they don't recognize it as, the, as negotiations. They say, look, we are consulting, basically. And uh, as condition precedent to real negotiations, that Ukraine should uh, uh, voluntarily agree to reverse the results of the uh, arbitrations, meaning that at least even we're talking, if we're talking about a so-called zero option, we should refuse from getting $2.8 billion of compensation, basically, for under-delivery, something that, again, it's fair for Ukraine to get, and it's a lot of money for Ukraine, but also it's a demonstration of the principle of this rule of law working. Um, but again, the other option is uh, maybe it's one of the scenarios, because if we just fully reverse the arbitration, it means that instead of getting $2.8 billion to Gazprom, we will have to pay to them more than $80 billion. So it's like kind of close to the size of our economy for us to understand what is at stake. And that's what Gazprom says, and the Russian side says, that look, even so after you basically re reverse the outcome of the arbitration, all we're ready to negotiate about is the extension of the current contract between Naftagaz and Gazprom mm -hmm. that is not compliant with the European regulation, so completely opposite position to the position of the European Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, then they say that uh, the way they interpret this contract, that it provides no guarantees uh, in terms of transit volumes. So even if we extend this transit contract, they may say in 2020, and they will say in 2020, sorry, but we have Nord Stream 2, we don't need the uh, Ukrainian route. Uh, or, again, uh, you are back to our political kind of backyard, that, so that we decide uh, what you do. Um, you're not an independent country anymore. So, again, just looking at this situation during these uh, trilateral negotiations, I currently see no optimism or no grounds to expect that there will be a reasonable deal and there will be transit through Ukraine. And again, and even if you look at numbers, again, uh, you can look at uh, Oxford um, uh, Institute of Energy Study report that was used by Gazprom, uh, where they say that even without Nord Stream 2, uh, Russia will be short of uh, 9 BCM of gas or something like that. But with Nord Stream 2, they can easily do without uh, Ukrainian route. And these discussions about swings in supply, flexibility, whatever, I mean, there are many ways how to deal with that, again, using underground uh, gas storages in Europe uh, acquired by Gazprom, again, or any other means. So, again, being from this industry, I'm saying that, again, uh, if Nord Stream 2 is finished, there is, uh, for Gazprom, it will be perfectly okay without uh, Ukrainian route. And the only leverage, basically, uh, Ukraine and the European Union has is to, uh, basically, to say that there will be no Nord Stream 2, unless uh, Ukrainian route is secured. So continuing building Nord Stream 2 and saying that it will help to secure uh, um, uh, Ukrainian transit, it's like saying that uh, getting food out of uh, uh, a person basically in need is uh, the best way to ensure that uh, there is no hunger. Um, maybe again, just uh, wrapping up. Um, um, we are, again, for us, as I said, the only defense is the rule of law, because, again, our opponent is uh, much uh, stronger. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many people in Europe still consider Russia as their strategic uh, energy partner. Um, and unfortunately, again, uh, it will result in, again, problems with stability in Europe, but that's the reality we have to face. Um, at the same time, we do believe that um, there is a rule of law inside Europe. Uh, there is a working um, legal system as demonstrated by our victories in Stockholm arbitration that we can discuss or now or later. And that's why we are determined to continue following this route. And uh, probably an announcement to make that uh, uh, it's our firm intention to bring us from abusive and, and illegal practices to EU attention in the form of competition law complaint that we are going to submit uh, in late April uh, 2019. So on top of fighting Gazprom uh, in arbitrations, uh, we will uh, start fighting Gazprom um, uh, 
uh, inside Europe using the competition law uh, as a ground for the benefit of European consumers, Ukrainian uh, state, and the stability uh, in the region. Uh, uh, we think that uh, it's something that uh, is required uh, to ensure uh, the future of Ukrainian gas transit system uh, or route, uh, as well as um, European um, energy security. And I will be happy to take uh, any specific questions uh, that uh, you might have. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fiora. Uh, sorry, ju just just another yeah. question. You say that there yeah. is a concrete possibility that Gazprom will not need any more the Ukrainian transit as of 2020. Yes, unfortunately, that's I would say the uh, base option, and uh, we have to deal with that. Okay, uh, but aren't there in place some supply contract with European <laughs> buyers? running until uh, 2021, 2022, that basically have a delivery point which is fixed in the contract. So basically, I if there is a diversion as of 2020, Gazprom would have to change the delivery point in existing contracts. Yes and no. Uh, we have, for example, Ben Schmidt in the audience, maybe he can provide even more data on that. But uh, there is a misconception that uh, uh, these flows that will go basically from Nord Stream 2 are destined to the uh, western part of Europe. Uh, in fact, if you look basically at the capacities uh, available and planned, you will see that uh, this gas will go basically uh, through uh, from Germany uh, to uh, Czech Republic, uh, to Austria, to Baumgarten, where the main delivery points are at the moment. So for the majority of contracts, basically, Russians won't even need to change delivery points. And if they need to change the delivery point, again, they're very successful in blackmailing European uh, uh, consumers. Uh, sometimes uh, many uh, European midstreamers uh, are happy to recall this golden era of gas and when together with Gazprom, they were controlling the entire market and enjoying some uh, abnormal economic returns. So, I mean, I can't see any problems in negotiating delivery points if they need uh, uh, it to be negotiated, because our analysis shows that it's not even needed. Thank you. It's really just to circumvent uh, um, Ukraine. Thanks. Um, okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I would like to, to conclude the, the panel discussion with some concluding remark by uh, Aliana Zierkal, Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine. Uh, Aliana, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation and bless you have the floor. very much for inviting me and I definitely think that the issue related to the future of Ukrainian gas transportation system for us a kind of existential issue. Not only because of uh, the security applications of the gas transportation through Ukraine, but also because it sh can show the real progress and move from deals to rules. And actually, this is echoes what uh, Carl said, that we should move from rights versus mights. And Ukraine has a long history of relations with Russia. And one of uh, the most sensitive topics was always energy. Since the very beginning of independence, we had to fix issues related to the gas supply despite the fact that we can easily extract gas from our natural resources. At the same time, I think that gas and energy was uh, one of the most uh, uh, intensive corrupt points in our history, in the history of relations with Russia. We all remember the history of the contract of 2009 and definitely I want to come back to this topic because that was a point where we clearly, not only Ukraine but also Europe, understood the sensitivity of the gas supply. And I think that we learned this lesson and we managed to create a more transparent and predictable environment in Ukraine. Of course, we based all our developments on European rules. And we continue to create this legal framework in Ukraine only on the ground of European rules. And that's we see as a kind of insurance against further deals. 
And this suggestion, which was offered by Russians during the last trilateral meeting, showed clearly that they are not interested in rules. They would like to continue make deals, despite the fact that these deals can lead to the crises. And this also shows us that probably their paramount interest is to create a crisis. And this crisis might give them an additional leverage. This leverage is not only for Ukraine. I think that they clearly have their geopolitical interests, and we are only one of the fields, battlefields for them. Of course, we are absolutely opposed to the construction of the Nord Stream 2, but not only because of the security threats. We are not against pipelines or uh, diversification of the routes of supplies, but we still think that the rules should be obligatory for all for, for players on the market, and uh, all players of the market should respect rules. Uh, the recent Russian statement, the statement of the minister of energy, Mr. Novak, just clearly reiterate their position that they're not interested in Ukrainian route. That despite all efforts made by European Commission and all other European leaders concerning the necessity to ensure the existence of Ukrainian route, they continue to manipulate with factors and manipulate with data. Uh, for example, stating that Ukrainian transit two and a half times more expensive than Nord Stream 2, which is not correct. And we spent hours for the discussion on the technical level in order to explain to our Russian colleagues all changes we've introduced in Ukrainian legal system based on European rules. Unfortunately, Gazprom did not participate in all the consultations, but the Russian Ministry of Energy was highly represented in this discussion. And that does not mean that they want any more uh, manipulate with data and information. I think that this is time when we should clearly stay on the same ground and force Russia to respect rules, first of all, European rules, and to play with and accordance with these rules. Otherwise, we will create more uncertainty and unpredictability. And Ukrainian elections is one of the focal points for us. That's why we pushed forward the necessity to amend our association agreement with the new rules and committed ourselves to fully approximate our energy legislation to the European Union one. Because for us, this is the only one insurance we may have against Russia and against the use of their famous tools of bribery and corruption. And we would like also to ensure that we reach a point of no return. And we urge Europe to be more clever and not to go for the business as usual with Russians, despite all the aggression we have in Ukraine. Because Ukraine is just the first case but it might not, be, might not be the last case of Russian aggression. And we truly believe that only the unity, the unity in different aspects, the unity in the energy security as well, can guarantee the prosperity of the whole Europe and Ukraine as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, We'll now open the floor to uh, 
to a discussion with uh, with the audience. So I see many many questions. Very good. So uh, we have three here. Uh, we start with. Uh, please introduce yourself before posing a question, and also if you can uh, let us know who you are posing the question to. Thanks. Uh, David Abiago from Argus Media. Um, question for Yuri Petrenko. Um, how do you see the the presidential elections actually affecting the um, mm -hmm. possibility of investment in, in the gas transport system? And, and on the European side, there seems to be... I mean, we had the European Investment Bank uh, looking at its energy strategy and gas is you know, going to take a, a much less, less of a position there and also, also investing in in a transport system from Russia to the EU, that's going to be something where they're un fairly unwilling to do. And then for Nicole Gibson, I was just wondering if you could outline the mechanism behind U US sanctions against, possible US sanctions against companies taking part in the Nord Stream 2. How realistic is that and on what stage are we on there? Yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Yuri Shiko. I'm a correspondent of uh, Deutsche Welle in Brussels. So I have two questions. First question is on unbundling, and this question is to Mr. Kyle and Mr. Vitrenko. Uh, there were talks about unbundling of NAFTA gas for, I don't know, for three years or more, uh, but there hasn't been, I mean, done much. And my question is, uh, when could we expect, because I understand there should be some decisions by the government and probably by the RADA. So where, when should we expect uh, decisions on which model of the unbundling will be uh, implemented? So when could we expect those decisions concrete? And the other question is on the uh, consumption of gas in Europe, because there are very different views on how it may change. So my question is to Ms. Gibson and Mr. Vitrenko, what are your uh, estimations on how the consumption of gas in Europe may change, like say in 10, Euro, uh, 10 uh, years? Many thanks. Thank you. Uh, one here. I take groups of three questions, then we go back to the panel, and then we take other round of questions. Right. Thank you. Uh, Jim Brook, Ukraine Business News, uh, based in Kyiv. Uh, Ms. Gibson, at the risk of being repetitive, I just want to follow up on my colleague from Argus's question. As you know, two months ago, the U.S. ambassador in Germany uh, sent letters to the contractors to, uh, doing Nord Stream 2. Uh, now, the snow has melted. Uh, the stacks of pipelines in Carl Belt's home country in Sweden are ready to be laid. Uh, when is the second shoe going to drop? Uh, it's spring, the Baltic is quiet, the pipelines will be laid. They're starting to relay them in, uh, in a few days or weeks, I'm sure. So the second shoe. And just for uh, our colleague, our friend from Naftogas, uh, just a day or two ago, your company uh, announced that uh, Russian gas going through the GTS was up 15% this winter in January and February. Uh, maybe it's 14.7%, but it's up 15%. Uh, does that imply that, and we've seen these spikes in the past where they've had to work on Nord Stream 1, do renovation, and actually your flow throughs have gone up. Uh, how confident are you that the Russians will not need the GTS next year? So the questions were for uh, Yuri and Nicole, mostly. So um, please, do you want to start? Uh, okay, so first of all, uh, the question was about presidential elections and investments. Uh, on one hand, there is no di direct link. So, for example, many of the loans uh, signed by the European Investment Bank or IBRD to modernize uh, Ukrainian gas transmission system uh, were signed even before the current president. Uh, at the same time, I think that th this focus is slightly again misplaced. So, uh, uh, actually, there is no problem uh, in terms of investments into Ukrainian gas transmission system. Car currently, it's a cash cow. Uh, for Ukraine. Uh, that's why we care that much about transit revenue. So it, it gives us, I don't know, $2.5 billion of cash uh, uh, every year. So again, there is absolutely no problem uh, uh, in terms of investing or reinvesting this money uh, in maintaining uh, the gas transmission system. It's in much better shape than, for example, uh, the Russian system. So we have seven times less incidents per 1,000 kilometers of uh, pipes uh, as they have in Russia. 
uh, of course, having said that, uh, uh, in order to modernize it to an extent where, again, uh, it's state-of-the-art technology, uh, we need a, a very solid business case. We need to understand who will use it. Because we have a huge system with capacity of 140 BCM. So it's uh, basically the entire consumption of Europe, of Russian gas, can be covered by Ukrainian gas transmission system. Again, it was built uh, during Soviet Union time with, again, American or German compressor stations. They're still working perfectly fine as nice uh, all, again, uh, um, equipment. But at the same time, they're not very cost efficient. So again, uh, yes, we can upgrade them, investing billions of dollars, but it makes absolutely no economic sense if we uh, see that uh, next year we won't have any transit volumes. And it's not even a chicken and egg problem. So it's not like, for example, without investment, there will be no transit. Again, the system is in very good shape. So investments into the system is just to make it more cost efficient, slightly more cost efficient. So instead of spending $500 million, we would spend $400 million per year on the maintenance. It doesn't change the thing. Uh, at the same time, there is a great threat that if uh, the new president uh, is a pro-Russian uh, president, um, openly or discreetly, whatever. Uh, and if we're back to uh, the previous kind of state of play, uh, that's what Russians are dreaming about when they say that we have to restore the balance in commercial relationship between Nafta, Gaz and Gazprom. For you to understand, this balance was about Ukraine paying every year $5 billion more for Russian gas that we were getting from, from, uh, uh, for transit. $5 billion 5% of Ukrainian GDP every year went from Ukraine to Russia. Now, basically, we pay for the entire amount of uh, imported gas, half a billion dollar less that we get from transit. So now we are getting cash, not we are paying basically to Russians. Of course, they're not happy with that. That makes Ukraine stronger, and they want Ukraine to be weaker. So if there is a pro-Russian candidate uh, that would basically realize this dream of uh, Russian empire to get Ukraine back under their control, and then it's uh, realistic to expect that, uh, uh, I mean, there will be political uh, will to, uh, uh, for, to, naf to make Nafta gas refuse from the uh, uh, victory in the previous arbitration, to make Nafta gas uh, cancel the new arbitration or withdraw its claims in the new arbitration, to make a deal as Mr. Uh, as, um, Deputy Foreign Minister Kyle said, basically, uh, uh, with Russia again, this deal would look like as a European one, uh, the same way we did it in 2009, when G uh, German, for example, uh, Chancellor uh, praised uh, Ukraine with uh, signing such a European deal uh, with Mr. Putin. So, again, we can go back to these times when Ukraine will just give money to, uh, to Russia to become weaker and to, be and to become an easy prey uh, for Russian uh, uh, ambitions, basically, geopolitical ones. And then, very quickly, there was a question of unbundling. Uh, we discussed it before, uh, I mean, that's my personal point of view that I can, again, substantiate. It's really like a catch-22 for Ukraine, and uh, it is a Russian narrative. Uh, uh, Russians are sophisticated enough sometimes to have conflicting narratives, as we, for example, saw in the U.S. when they were meddling in the U.S. elections. Uh, so basically, on one hand, they don't allow Nafta gas to unbundle because they don't allow Nafta gas to assign a transit contract. Nafta gas is a party to this transit contract to um, an independent TSO, to unbundle TSO. And without such an assignment, basically, uh, uh, we should either stop the transit that we won't do because we are a reliable partner uh, for Europe uh, in terms of transiting gas. Uh, or we have to do something that, ha I mean, it's difficult again, even though it's not feasible, basically, to split the system into a domestic one and a transit one. We have a united system. Transit amounts for 88% uh, for um, our transmission work. So domestic transmit, uh, transit, uh, transmission is to some extent a byproduct, basically, of, the, uh, of transit. And splitting these two systems is like years and billions of dollars. It makes no economic sense. So that is why, and again, we asked Gazprom to uh, uh, allow this assignment to uh, unbundle TSO in front of the European Commission many times. Gazprom refused. On the other hand, they're promoting this narrative that Ukraine is not unbundling. Ukraine is not serious about reforms. Again, there were many years of discussions, but no real results and stuff like that. Again, just to reiterate, uh, the only reason 
the only reason why, for example, Nafta Gas cannot now uh, assign the contract uh, to, an, um, to, for example, Ukr Transgas, our own transmission subsidiary, and unbundle this, uh, this uh, subsidiary is basically Gazprom, uh, Gazprom's position. Uh, hopefully, again, uh, this year is the last year of the existing contract. Uh, although Gazprom proposed, again, subject to uh, us reversing the arbitration to negotiate an extension of the existing contract, we said no. We said the new contract should be based on the European rules, basically. And these European rules uh, will allow unbundling. So hopefully, uh, from the next year, uh, uh, Ukraine will have an unbundled uh, TSO, and this saga uh, will um, end. Uh, then again, very quickly answering the questions, uh, consumption of uh, gas in Europe and some flexibility. So uh, the way we see it, that uh, the base option is that consumption in Europe will be more or less uh, flat. Uh, there is this, again, Russian narrative that consumption in Europe will increase, and that's why Europe will need more gas, uh, and that's why Ukrainian route uh, will be... Uh, in demand even uh, after Nord Stream 2. We, we don't buy it. We can't see it basically happening. It's just, uh, again, for them, an easy excuse to continue building uh, Nord Stream 2. And for some German politicians also to an excuse basically to say why they're supporting Nord Stream 2. Uh, on fa uh, in fact, we see the opposite trade uh, trend. Of course, again, we all heard about decarbonization. We all understand that if Europe needs to meet uh, its climate targets, especially to show leadership in the world and to some extent even compensate basically for other countries not meeting their climate targets, uh, Europe need, uh, needs to cut gas consumption. And uh, we also see that renewables become uh, more and more economic. So from that perspective, uh, gas uh, is already becoming like a balancing service rather than the primary source of uh, energy. So from that perspective, again, yes, gas will be used in Europe uh, probably, again, uh, in some in next years, but we will see its, uh, at least its role changing, basically, and the volumes uh, not growing. And in terms of, for example, flexibility, uh, 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 current this increase of 15 percent. Uh, uh, first of all, again, it's really dependent on weather. Uh, but also, uh, we see that Russia is preparing for the scenario of no transit uh, uh, through Ukraine uh, next year, meaning that they now send more gas to Europe, for example, to use their own underground gas storages to fulfill their contractual obligations. So then if even there are some small delays with Nord Stream 2 at the beginning of uh, 2020, uh, they will be OK without uh, Ukrainian route. That's what we see. That's why we have to be aware, everybody in this room, that again, it's very, very realistic that there will be no transit uh, uh, through Ukraine from 2020. Thank you. Uh, some questions were for Nicole. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, there was there was a couple of pointed uh, questions at the same the same subject uh, with future sanctions. The United States, as I mentioned earlier, does not comment on future sanctions actions, um, and so there isn't something to say here beyond that. Um, but uh, we have said, and I'll, I'll state it again, that we've been clear that firms operating in the Russian energy export uh, pipeline sector risk significant sanctions. Um, and that's all that I can say at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a second uh, uh, round of questions. Uh, Paul and one here and uh, one over there. Yes, thank you. Uh, Paul Ivan from the European Policy Center. I have a, a question uh, over here yeah. to Mr. Vitrenko. Um, not, not challenging the scenario of, of the no transit role for Ukraine for, for next year, but could you please clarify in which way you see that delivery of gas could be done to the to the Balkans. Uh, now, several countries in the in the in the Balkans are buying gas from Russia, which does pass through to Ukraine. How, how do you see that, that happening? If transit from Ukraine would be would be stopped. Uh, well, uh, okay. 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 Thank you, Gabriela Vakaritsa, I'm editor in chief of Energynomics.ro, which is a communication platform for energy from Romania. My question is addressed to each of the panelists, and uh, it is um, in relation with the, the advancement for the new gas directive. Uh, the EU Council agreement on this negotiating mandate was presented like a success in uh, recent weeks under the Romanian presidency of the EU Council, especially after the delay during the Austrian presidency. 
However, taking into consideration the wording of this uh, um, negotiating, uh, negotiating mandate, my question is, do you see it as a uh, win for the country supporting Nord Stream 2, a win for the countries opposing Nord Stream 2, <laughs> or maybe it is irrelevant for the near future? Thank you. Alan Riley, Atlantic Council. My, my, my um, observation, I think, is to, is to Yuri, really. And it's, um, you were saying about the fact that the gas is really not going to go very much to Western Europe. I mean, one of the points about uh, the Nord Stream 2 gas, and I think this is a, a point to uh, really make and really make quite forcefully. There's a lot of stories, a lot of the propaganda you get from Nord Stream 2 and is that somehow it's going to provide extra gas uh, to Europe, and it's going to fill the, gra the, the gap caused by the fall in production from the great Groningen field. And this Groningen lever story, you need our gas because of the collapse of the Groningen, uh, uh, or the, the fall in Groningen production. This is a nonsense. It's a nonsense for two reasons. First of all, all that's going to happen with Nord Stream 2, as with Nord Stream 1, is that gas which was going through the Ukrainian transit will switch pipelines and go through Nord Stream 2 mm. instead. Mm. But the thing which is most dramatic mm. is the gas, or most of the gas from the um, Nord Stream 2 will not go anywhere near Western Europe. There's a pipeline called Eugal, which Yuri's referred to. It's got 55 billion cubic meters of capacity, i.e. the entire capacity of the um, Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And it will go, and it goes eastward toward Baumgarten, where all the Ukrainian uh, all the Ukrainian transit gas currently goes into, and it'll be able to provide all the gas in that direction instead. So the question I think ultimately what you've got to ask, and this is where I think there's a huge issue of European policy. Ever since the creation of the coal and steel community in 1951, we've been creating first of all unified markets in, in, in coal and steel, and then unified common market and single market. This is the first occasion since the creation of any of the treaties that we've got a situation that actually the single market that's been created in gas is in danger of being partitioned. Because once you have a situation where you've got the oil gale gas coming through from Nord Stream 2, flooding the west to, east, west to east interconnectors, so nobody else's gas can get through, you'll only have the Gazprom controlled gas from Nord Stream 2 via Oigar. You'll have the switching off of the Ukrainian transit. So Gazprom will have an enhanced market dominant position within the single market in gas. So essentially you have two markets in Europe. You have the liberalized Western European gas market and the Gazprom dominated market in Central and Eastern Europe. And that is why the Pol Poland is, is seeking to create uh, alternative infrastructure because it fears mm -hmm. that it will be subject this market dominance and this separate market in Central and Eastern Europe. So this is not just an issue of Ukrainian secure, supply security. This is an issue of European supply security. And even above that, it's a direct threat to the primordial uh, development of the European Union, its mm -hmm. own single market. I think I'll stop that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'll go, go back to the, uh, the debate. Uh, I'll connect just with the point of Alan, uh, we know that Poland uh, is working to stop buying Russian gas from uh, any any source. Now my question uh, is, at the same time, Poland has been very much supportive for any offer, uh, or any effort from uh, Ukraine, but isn't uh, this uh, um, sort of mandated diversification goes towards or against the interests of Ukraine somehow? So maybe. You want to elaborate on that? Uh, so first of all, answering the question about the supplies to Balkan uh, countries, it's a very good question. Uh, at the same time, um, our understanding is that uh, uh, Turkish Stream uh, will replace all the volumes that uh, uh, goes uh, uh, through Ukraine uh, to Romania and then to these uh, Balkan countries, is if uh, that's what you're asking for. So it's about uh, 30 BCM or up to 30 BCM that goes uh, through Ukraine to Romania for, for transit. Romania is more or less self-sustainable. They will start in exporting gas. Uh, um, and basically, again, Turkish team will be used uh, for supplies to Balkan countries. 
Um, in terms of uh, Armenian presidency and uh, uh, the adoption of the um, uh, certain or spreading of the certain or adoption of the directive, basically, uh, uh, we are very thankful from our side because uh, uh, Armenian uh, presidency uh, uh, resulted in some real action. Uh, it remains to be seen uh, to be seen how effective it will be, because now basically uh, the ball will be uh, on the side again of the German uh, uh, government and German regulator. So we will see how independent and competent the German German regulator uh, is basically. Um, um, but uh, it, 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 that's definitely uh, the move uh, into the right direction, and it sends a very strong signal uh, to everybody that there is a, a rule of law in Europe, that uh, um, uh, even new Euro European EU member states like uh, Romania are really sticking to these uh, Western values, uh, sometimes unlike their uh, more developed colleagues, uh, and also basically that uh, uh, Europe is united, uh, when it's critically needed uh, to stand against basically uh, some threats to the rule of law um, inside um, uh, Europe. That's the way uh, at least uh, I see it. Maybe uh, our uh, Deputy Foreign Minister wants to add something. Yeah, uh, we are very grateful for Romanian presidency on adopting this and making this actually possible to adopt these amendments to the gas directive because we were advocating for them for a year and even more. We definitely think that this is a kind of way forward for the creation of the common legal ground for any kind of operators in European market. And again, coming back to the efforts, I think that now it very much depends on the way how these amendments uh, will be implemented. And definitely here we see the primary role of European Commission. And we still think that the most obvious and accurate way how to regulate Nord Stream 2 in case of its construction would be an agreement between European Commission and Russia where all kind of issues can be fixed. And actually it was the position of European Commission years ago that this is a way forward. And that's how we see and support. And then a very important question from Marco that I really wanted to focus on about uh, how we see this diversification and competition, all this kind of stuff. It's our principal position that we're not trying to defend uh, some kind of transit monopoly as described by our German colleagues. Uh, we are supporting a level playing field and an efficient market inside Ukraine, outside Ukraine, the integrated uh, uh, European market. Uh, and for us, it, it means a lot, not just uh, uh, because, again, as we said, the rule of law is the only protection we can have against uh, Gazprom, but also even from purely economic reasons. Uh, and it applies also to the interests of European consumers. So, uh, again, we are, for example, very supportive of Central Asian gas producers being able to transit gas through Russia and then through Ukraine mm -hmm. to the European market. It will benefit, again, German consumers. Mm -hmm. German prices will be lower. By the way, the only reason why we saw declining uh, gas prices in Germany last years is because of American LNG coming to the global market. And that's why we saw this decoupling. That's why, basically, we saw Russia losing their ability to uh, command such um, abnormally high prices, basically, in the German market. Um, so more gas means more competition, means lower prices for European consumers. And then we want, again, independent producers in Russia, uh, including European companies, including German companies, being able to export gas again to Germany, for example, using Ukrainian system or using any other system. Uh, also, we want European companies to buy Russian gas, even from Gazprom, on Ukrainian-Russian border, and be able to book capacities in Ukraine, and let them decide what they want to use. Our problem is that Russia illegally blocks uh, the use of Ukrainian gas transmission system for exclusive use of Gazprom. And again, and unfortunately, international partners allow that. So should you, for example, say, look, Russia and Gazprom, first you play by the rules, you follow all the, again, uh, decisions and the words of the uh, decision of the courts and the words uh, of tribunals, 
you basically unblock Central uh, uh, Asian transit. You unblock uh, export of independent producers. You let European companies buy gas on Ukrainian Russian border. And then you are okay to go ahead with Nord Stream 2. That would not be a problem, at least not a problem to an extent uh, like we have now. They won't build Nord Stream 2 because then they don't need it, because the only reason why they need Nord Stream 2 is to be able to abuse their dominance in the European market. But we are for the level playing field. We are for the uh, um, uh, diversification. Because we import gas, we are, for example, for lower prices of gas in Europe. We are in the same boat with Europe in this particular case. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, it's difficult where to start. I, I, I think I would like to make three points. Well, first of all, I'm not here to defend a German position nor saying something about the Rush, Russian position. I'm here as an energy expert and I'm trying to, to really enlighten the picture and to get the puzzle right. And the more I hear, I'm, I'm blown away by any argument. I think it's very tricky and, and difficult to really look I through the, the well. darkness. And the only truth I see is that the world is not black and white, but gray. And I, I, I try to, 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 to look at the different pieces. Well, uh, and, and take this seriously. I'm, I'm not here. Um, I, I know that I'm here in a quite difficult role coming from, from Berlin. But uh, I'm, I'm seriously trying to, to get a sense what does this all mean for European energy security. First, the question on the gas directive. I, I don't take this, this view of winners and losers. What, what I think is now important that we have, this is now the situation that we're having. I think it's a big chance. What I do see is that finally it's, it's a move to have well, it, it, a move in line with the European Energy Union. And, and let me put it that way, what, how I analyzed the German, uh, let's say, fall back position in the last years was that it stick, stuck very much to the status quo and a very legal position saying that this is uh, our basis of the rule of law and we have the procedures. What it somehow denied was the political process and movement towards a European energy union. So st standing in a status quo situation while somehow ignoring the, the political move towards a union which is, lies more into the future and, and not acknowledging that you have to move somehow. To, to, to fill in this, this future gap. So, so this is why I'm saying this, this is a chance now. And I, I think this is also why I'm saying it is, an, I, I see really a new business model for Ukraine. It, it's not that I'm saying a monopolist, um, um, Renzi, but the, I really mean that this is now kind of competition possible and a business model for, for capacity bookings. Because you have a, a situation where you could apply the rules and and honestly i still lack a clear understanding what this all means and i i, I really we just discussed that outside what is now needed is really clear legal assessment and exchange and a dialogue and and a real honest dialogue am among all of us to 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 yeah to enlighten the situation my next point is uh, and i know that it, it while saying that i know already again that it's tricky i I'm trying to understand what Nord Stream 2 does to the European market. And, and where I, I understand and I agree to the points um, that, that Alan and others made is that the consumer surplus is changing and that, that there is a real threat towards higher prices in, in Eastern Europe with, with the, the gas flows changing. This to me and, and also to Ukraine when, when losing the transit, uh, transit function, this to me is, um, I think this is where, where I understand the argumentation. Where I don't share the view is that Nord Stream 2 is coming and splitting a market that is integrated. No, it's not. Because um, you have a, a very closed Poli Polish market where you have a clear state monopoly um, and, and not really a functioning 
um, um, liberalized comp competitive market and you have a very state-centered approach also to diversification for very understandable reasons. Don't get me wrong. This is why I said I, I do really see two realities being in place and working. The economic side of the story in, in Germany is very much driven away by this economic rationality. And then you have this bigger picture of political and security threats. And I, I really see the case of Poland, as my colleague always says, it taking a very defensive sovereignty and, and, and trying to diversify. But the effects <laughs> are somehow that, that the market is split and that um, the, the third energy market package is not, not really that in, implemented fully. And so we have a split. And finally, I, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I have really difficulties. If we see an integrated functioning European market, then a molecule is no longer a Russian molecule when it enters the market. And, and I don't know why we apply then this kind of transit idea to Eugard. I see the, posi the, the point of the capacity of um, the nine BCM into uh, well the, the, the northeastern German market, but then you have uh, not only um, over, over now, but you also have then Gazelle again linking to White House, which is entering the um, cell, uh, where the net connect Germany um, market area. So you have again a link into Germany. And by the way, we will have a lot of flows changing in the German market because we're going to have an, a single market area in Germany. And this will again um, really make a lot of where well, we, we, will, we will have to see how to sort that out. That is another big. Um, challenge on on the German market, but this is this is where I'm confused about this this Olga thing. It doesn't White House then um, again um, bring in volumes that are very important in this area, whereas we have really have a gas deficit, and also for France, also ha having the challenge there. But that's more a question, and and really where I try to 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 get a better. Thank you. Uh, before going back to the uh, to the audience, uh, I think I have another question. Yes, I have a question, if that's allowed, sure. uh, <laughs> um, or, or one, one, one remark, one remark and one question. I mean, you brought up another aspect of it, which I think is very important, that um, things would be, of course, far better if we could get Russia Gazprom to accept transit of Central Asian gas. And that goes to what you just mentioned, the sort of competitive, the, the competitive model of Ukraine, that it can be a transit for all sorts of different things. but. At the moment, we have a Russian policy that does not allow that. And that would be a critical factor for us to press Russia harder to accept that particular transit. Second, and that's a question for Yuri, um, we also have an interest when we discuss Russia to further the long-term modernization of the Russian gas system by liberalizing that one. Uh, we discuss, discuss only Gazprom here, because Gazprom is, to my knowledge, the only supplier to Europe. Is that correct? Yes, they have an expert monopoly pipeline for yeah. pipeline gas, so uh, they yeah. can export, others can export LNG, but not Absolutely, the pipeline gas. Absolutely, because what, what we see, what we see, Novatec has been expanding yep. quite substantially, yep. and uh, the gas that we are discussing here, coming to Germany or mm -hmm. wherever it's coming to, is essentially from the West Siberian fields. Mm -hmm. The West Siberian fields are slowly sort of degrading, but it's more Yamal, the north of that, that is now expanding. Mm -hmm. I see Novatec being the number one actor there. And that gas is now going LNG to Korea, Japan. It's Asia yeah. gas, big time, mm -hmm. private, not Gazprom. Yeah. Uh, so what kind of, no question to you as an expert in the field, what kind of long-term development do you see in developing of the Russian gas industry? And is the stronger role for Novatec now um, a sign of things changing for Gazprom as well? We have to be clear uh, why there is... I take oh, okay, some okay. other okay. questions yeah. from, the, from the audience. So uh, one here, one here, and one here. Uh, I'm Ivan Verstuk, a journalist of Ukrainian weekly magazine Nova Vrema. I get another question for Yuri Vitrenka. Earlier today, you've mentioned that Naftagas is going to file a, probably another court case on Gazprom breaking European Union's uh, competition uh, rules. Can you please give a little bit more details on this? My name is Dmitry Shkurko, National News Agency of Ukraine. Uh, my question 
question is quite obvious when we are speaking about no deal scenario we usually mention uh, the uh, backstop and uh, brexit you know. <laughs> but, but, but right now we have a uh, absolutely uh, possibility that no deal scenari scenario will bring us to, to the new crisis so that my question is uh, just uh, to uh, Ukrainian Minister uh, Olena and uh, to Christian, if I may. Uh, so that what kind of contingency plans uh, uh, both sides, I mean Ukraine and the uh, European Union, uh, predict uh, to face the challenge that we can face already from the beginning of the next year? And uh, uh, if I may, the question to Carl Bildt, uh, there is all this uh, problem in uh, mental uh, understanding of each other in communication between East and West because uh, what you uh, men mentioned and you say uh, that uh, accepted in different way. When you say in about the rules of law, not politics, they say, I mean, Russians say that uh, you invent those laws to, to, to influence and uh, to conduct uh, the anti-Russian uh, politics. So that my question to you is maybe slightly naive. How can uh, Europe uh, and the European community, international community, uh, to force uh, uh, one side at least, uh, which is not one to obey the rules, to obey the rules. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, Siobhan Hall from Platz. Um, I have a question for Nicole. Um, I understood that you want the EU to stop Nord Stream 2 being completed. Can you give us an idea of what practical measures the EU could take? Because we don't have the same sanction abilities that you do. And um, perhaps to Mr. Ventrenko, um, could you give us an update on where, where negotiations are on the new transit deal? Yes, first, uh, uh, the question about the expert monopoly um, um, uh, of Gazprom and the, what Novatec can do and uh, how they can, uh, again, be present in the market. Uh, my understanding that the only, uh, or there are two reasons basically for Russia to have, uh, uh, to keep expert monopoly for, uh, of pipeline gas to Gazprom. Uh, the first the reason is a political one because uh, uh, Kremlin wants to be in position uh, to have to make political deals uh, using uh, gas uh, uh, as a tool. So, for example, they say, look, Germans, we want to have strategic partnership with you. Uh, we will make uh, Russian gas uh, in Germany the cheapest among all the other uh, European countries. Uh, you will have uh, an unfair advantage against all the other European countries because you will have cheaper gas. Uh, your economy will grow faster than the uh, economy of your uh, neighbors. So why don't we have such a deal? And then, uh, again, uh, economically minded people in Germany say super, super, such a, such a classy deal, basically. We would have a competitive advantage over our uh, European neighbors. Uh, the reason why uh, Russia, Russia is doing that, because they want to split Europe, basically because uh, apparently all the other European nations will say, look, uh, that's not what we expect from European leader, basically, to have such a deal with Putin that uh, would result in some unfair competitive advantage uh, for Germany. But that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, the second reason, basically, is like purely economic one. Uh, that's a so-called monopolistic rent. So we can open uh, an economics textbook 101 and read, basically, that uh, a monopoly will discriminate by price, uh, um, uh, trying to maximize their profits. So they want to sell gas at different prices in different markets. And uh, uh, with an expert monopoly, they can uh, reach such an objective. Of course, if there are 100 uh, hypothetical exporters from Russia, uh, then they cannot collude, basically, and we will have a competitive market in Europe with lower prices. Uh, again, to the detriment of uh, uh, Russia, uh, Russia's income from uh, gas sale. Um, so that's why they're keeping this monopoly. The, the only question that I don't understand, why Europe is accepting it. So why, instead of fighting it, they are, for example, as Alan says, uh, they are exporting basically uh, Russian corruption into Europe, Russian monopolistic behavior into Europe. Instead of trying to export, again, the rule of law uh, to neighboring countries uh, for the benefit of stability um, inside Europe. Um, that is why, and we discussed, by the way, Russian companies, including the one, the, I mean, I don't, I don't want to call names, but Russian companies were approaching NAFTA gas, saying, look, for example, we want to export gas, can we do it through Ukraine? We said, sure. 
again and again, we, we are having now more or less uh, European rules in terms of capacity bookings. So everybody can come and book capacities of Ukrainian gas admission system. You don't even need trilateral negotiations for that. The problem is that technically you cannot do it because there is no interconnection agreement between Naftagaz and Gazprom, and Russia is not allowing uh, uh, to, uh, to move gas out of Russia except for Gazprom. Um, so that, that's the sad reality. I don't know uh, when it will change, but I clearly see that uh, Novatec, Rosneft, uh, again, German companies, uh, Dutch companies, Shell, uh, other companies uh, uh, can and should export their gas. Uh, again, pipeline uh, transportation of gas is more efficient than LNG. Russia is forcing them to build LNG plants uh, uh, to export LNG, but again, uh, they should have an alternative, and the Ukrainian system will be in high demand uh, for that. Um, answering the last question, at least uh, to me, not the second one, basically is um, um, about uh, this complaint. So um, currently we're filing a complaint uh, to the European Commission. Uh, uh, probably we can take it offline. We have our English barrister. We're very serious about this complaint. So it's not just basically uh, we will complain uh, and file like again one uh, uh, page, uh, you see, uh, with what we need. It's a very, very, again, kind of uh, substantiated uh, complaint uh, that uh, we believe uh, will have a lot of uh, resonance. Uh, but we can take it offline and then we can introduce you to our uh, English barrister who can basically talk more about that. Um, the last question is about the status of negotiations. Um, um, we agreed uh, with the European Commission that we would have the next round in May. Uh, by the way, we're really grateful to the European Commission. We have the same position as they have. We have like complete uh, uh, consensus about everything, so that the European law should be uh, applied. Even, uh, by the way, the latest uh, proposal from Mr. Shevchevich, uh, it's not 60 plus minus 30, it's 60 plus 30. Uh, and this minus basically makes a lot of difference. But this 60 plus 30 uh, proposal, again, makes some sense. So at least if Gazprom books 60 on a long-term basis, as proposed by the European Commission, plus uh, we would uh, uh, commit to provide uh, additional 30 BCM of capacity uh, for, Russian, uh, for the gas of Russian transit gas to be available for Gazprom, for Novatec, uh, for again German companies, for Central Asian gas producers, for everybody, that's a very reasonable scenario. We can even commit to produce, to provide more flexibility. We can say, okay, 60 for Gazprom, and the rest, 140 minus 60, basically, it makes this uh, 80. So we can commit even to provide 80 uh, BCM of uh, additional capacity to the market, to all the market uh, participants. Uh, but unfortunately, again, uh, there are no indications whatsoever that Russians will agree to it. There are no indication that in May we will have uh, again, any kind of reasonable uh, negotiations. Um, to, like, for example, we had the discussion uh, with some of the panelists. Uh, uh, one should expect that Russians uh, will continue building Nord Stream 2 uh, because that's what is really important for them uh, while waiting for political changes in, in Ukraine. So again, for the new president, then for the new parliament, uh, then for the new European, basically, commission. So nothing will happen uh, uh, probably till the end of the year. Uh, then, in terms of the results, expected results of the challenge proceedings uh, in, in Sweden, uh, we expect the result, we expect hearings only in February next year, and the result basically only in summer next year. So, in this year, there will be no clarity uh, about the challenge proceedings uh, uh, of the previous arbitration, and we won't agree in our right mind, basically, to reverse uh, the uh, results of the arbitration. So that's why, unfortunately, I can't have any kind of optimism uh, for uh, constructive negotiations uh, this year. Thank you. Nicole? Mm -hmm. um, so you, you've asked the question about what, what we think the EU could do. Uh, I see the U.S. gas directive is extremely important. Um, this is something we have been supportive of. We're looking to see how it's implemented and how it moves forward. Um, we are also seeing a lot of lot more unity every day from European member states um, in in response to, for example, um, the different actions that that um, Nord Stream Two will will cause um, the the, um, the harm to Ukraine. Um, I think 
people are starting to talk and starting starting to speak out. And and the concern is that this sounds, I think, in a lot of uh, areas that there's the fait accompli here, that Nord Stream 2 is definitely going to be done. Um, we don't see it that way. We see it's really important now to have these discussions. Um, we also hope that in light of Russia's recent attack on the Ukrainian ships near the Kurt Strait on November 25th, that European leaders will also unify to re reject the completion of Nord Stream. Um, on those grounds as well. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, we see it as a diversionary pipeline. Thank you. Well, what, what, what can Europe do uh, in order to make certain that it is uh, right rather than might that applies? Well, we can. Um, I remember from the time I was foreign minister, I had to deal quite extensively with uh, probably the non-EU foreign minister that I dealt with most was Mr. Lavrov in sort of dialogues of all sorts of issues had a high entertainment value at times. Um, but, but one of the things that irritated him the most was the third energy package and the, uh, and the uh, competition case brought by, by, by the Commission against Gazprom. And he kept repeating that we will never, ever, never, ever, ever go into any such negotiation. Well, at the end of the day, they had to. And there was some sort of agreement and some sort of resolution to that in May of last year. Uh, because at the end of the day, Russia has a lot of gas, but you can't really eat it. You have to sell it. Um, and uh, we, the Europeans, are the number one market. And if, if, if you are the market, you have the market power. And if you are unified and use the market power, uh, we are very powerful. Uh, and uh, so that we, they can eat the gas if they think that's healthy. But if they want to sell it, they'll have to sell it according to the rules where the consumer actually have a lot of power. And we demonstrated with that competition case that, yes, that can be applied. Uh, so we should not be entirely pessimistic about the possibilities that we de facto have. But we need also to demonstrate, of course, the political will to do it. Um, and just make one side remark on the timing. Uh, no deal. I think that was a good comment on the the no-deal scenarios that we're dealing with. <laughs> what a mess. Um, <laughs> I fear that this is going to take quite some time here because first, um, you can see all sorts of problems with setting up the new commission here in town. Um, I can see even more problem with setting up a government in Ukraine because it is highly likely that the RADA is going to be more fractured. Uh, the European Parliament is also going to be more fractured, by the way. But the RADA is also going to be more fractured than the present one, which will probably, that's just a guess, make the formation of the new Ukraine government a somewhat more time-consuming process. So this could slip quite some time, and then we are into the second of our European no-deal scenarios. And that brings me also to the assumption that we need to finalize all our actions according to our plan A before the mid-July. And our plan A is to ratify new amendments to the association agreement and to make them legally binding and to implement them in any case and in any scenario, because any president or any new government will be obeyed with these rules. So this is our plan A, to create a transparent environment within Ukraine and to make sure that any kind of the government will have to respect this. And definitely we are very much rely on the stance of the European Commission in this respect as well because we can perfectly work uh, under the sticks. Definitely we need some carrots, but sticks are also necessary. Uh, at the same time, we work together with our partners on the contingency plans. And uh, we are already in uh, dialogue with uh, our European partners concerning their views on the resilient plans, and we elaborate our own resilient plans with the assistance of the United States. And definitely, we learned the lesson we had in 2009, and I hope Europe learned this lesson as well.
Um, f first, the question on, on emergency and, and prevention. Um, I think, yeah, 2009, the lessons were learned and um, Europe, in a sense, is, and if I say Europe, then, then I, I include um, also energy community countries and, and, and certainly the EU, that, that we are quite well prepared because this is the homework, homework that has been done and I think successfully done with all the interconnections and prevention plans. And again, repeating what I said before, I think this is the big success story so far internally to create a, a functioning gas market um, and especially with regard to, to um, security of supply provisions. Um, where the EU has not been so successful so far is the inter external dimension in building alternative pipelines because the EU as such doesn't build pipelines. So, so that's kind, kind of where, 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 where we lack certain um, yeah, might and power. And I, I, I mention that because um, this again strengthens the argument that it's so important to work on the Ukrainian case and to keep Ukraine in, in this legal um, framework and space because the EU somehow shifted its strategy with enlargement. We, we, we no longer relied on the energy charter treaty because also Russia withdraw and we know the story related also to the Yukos <laughs> case. But it was a very strong approach taken by the the European Union to export its a key communautaire to the neighborhood. And, and this is where we really see the test case and we really face big challenges. Um, and of course, it would be in an ideal world, I would also hope that Novatec is getting, well, the, the, the export monopoly is liberalized for Novatec, Rosneft, which I, I don't perceive as independent gas companies at all because they are still linked to the Kremlin. But as, as such, it's at least non-gas, prom gas, and would bring some competition. But, but I don't see that because I, in a sense, I see us in the EU sticking towards E, the EU-Russia bilateral game. But if, if I take the broader picture, and I really think the challenge is getting bigger, and this is why I mentioned China, I really see that the gas market to some extent is getting more politically interventionist. There is a lot of, um, yeah, of course you have LNG diversification, and I agree, and this is why it's so important to keep up volumes and then next waves coming and engage as us, as Europe in the LNG strategy. And I think we are well off with that. We're well doing that. But on the other hand, the whole pipeline um, and also big gas um, uh, LNG exporters are looking into political deals, are looking into diversification. China is, is, is a growing actor on the continent, the Europe, Asian market, and, and, and not at all playing to market rules. So in a sense, if I, I look and take the broader continental picture, the challenge is not only to um, export the Aki Communautaire, that would be nice, uh, certainly. But if you have other players with strong state links and they are doing their deals, then you have to look into your toolbox and think and reflect. So a challenge is what you mentioned also, ensuring interoperability of the different systems. So I'm always thinking and reflecting, shouldn't we talk more closely to the Eurasian Economic Union? And then, of course, I get all the arguments. It, it's an hegemonic space. But whatever, I think there is a technical and regulatory need to exchange with the, in, in order to avoid regulatory regulatory fault lines where you could have geopolitical conflicts um, being reloaded in a sense, because this is what I see us running into with the situation of, of uh, muddling through or no deal. It's, it's going to be very tricky and maybe even a long period of, of crisis and non-deliveries because we have a quite resilient system in place. So that's, that's kind of challenge. I would like to respond, if I may, to... Um, this issue of, um, um, I, I do see, I mean, I'm, I'm very concerned now hearing that the, the window of opportunity for an, an, an unbundled TSO opens only, if I got that right, uh, at the beginning of 2020. Because then I really see an hen and egg problem, because how would you start to negotiate a, 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 an agreement, a, 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 a rule-based, um, um, yeah, 
package with 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 Russia without having a counterpart, a reliable counterpart also for for European companies. So this is this is really a question. Don't you see then here a hand and egg problem? And then your point. Um, and again, I'm, I'm just puzzled here because we had some minutes before we had the argument that the volumes through Nord Stream 2 are, uh, are directed to bypass Ukraine and not directed to Germany. And now the argument is more that, that you say that that there is a divide and rule because um, Germany is, of course, profiting for this huge um, amount of gas and, and this um, um, strong hub position it is getting. And of course you have this issue of, of competitiveness in Germany. And I agree in a sense here, but, but I see these two arguments being kind, kind of in, in, in conf conflict, so I'm puzzled here. But if I take your argument seriously on, on the competitiveness of Germany, yes, I think this has played a strong role for Germany in this um, approach to back Nord Stream 2 because, I mean, BASF, you have all the challenge, and you mentioned the LNG glut yourself and the shale revolution. There is a big pressure by petrochemical companies to move into the US for bigger, bigger, better access to cheaper energy. And you have the whole discussion around shifting petrochemicals from NAFTA to ethane. So this is a challenge for the industrial heart of Germany, if you wish. And BASF yes, has, has a consumption like Denmark. So, so we're really talking um, big issues here. Um, but uh, and, and there are few countries, let's, let's make this point, which really use that much gas for their industry. And if I'm not mistaken, it's it's in the Netherlands, it's Italy, and it's Germany that really have have to have an access for for their industry and manufacturing. And it's not just BSF, but it's also bigger companies. So in a sense, yeah, this is a tricky position here, and and there is a pressure on the German government to pursue here national interests. And and this is also what what I observed. What I think is now coming, and I think this is coming all over the EU, and this is why I also mentioned energy security looking now to the end consumer, is exactly the issue of prices. And I think it will come up in the European elections, the, the social cost of not only of cost of carbon abatement, but also the social cost of energy transition and natural gas comes on top of it. And Germany, of course, has the, the, the plan to phase out nuclear quite soon, the, pl the plan to phase out coal-fired power plants. And now gas is somehow seen as a transitional fuel, at least. And hopefully we, we find a pathway towards a more sustainable future. But what I'm saying is that gas does play a major role in the development of energy costs. And we, I think we shouldn't ignore that. And I think this is an issue that will come up. Thank you very much. Uh, I think as we have to uh, close uh, uh, really, really sharp, uh, I think I will have to, um, to close the debate here, uh, I think. Uh, it was a very, uh, a very interesting uh, discussion. Many thanks to to all the speakers for their, um, for their great remarks. Uh, I think that probably the lesson to gather from 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 this is that in this environment characterized by uh, significant geoeconomic confrontation, the EU as an actor has quite a lot of us good assets uh, to to play uh, as long as it plays it in a united manner and quite strategically. And this can really exert uh, a positive influence of a number of third actors, being uh, Ukraine or being even Russia and, uh, and even more. So uh, thank you uh, very much. And uh, uh, we hope to see you uh, again very soon at other uh, events from the EPC. And uh, please join me in uh, thanking our speakers.